Hi, um, I'm super happy to be with you all today. Um, I will start my talk uh, with a picture of Vida, my daughter. Um, she's at school today, so she could not come, but usually she tags along to conferences. Um, and she's a, she's a smart cookie, so I think we will start coding together pretty soon. Um, that being said, my name is Mathieu Henry. I go online as P01. Um, in the background, you can see some of my projects. Um, they all have some kind of animations, some have sound, some are interactive, and they are all around 64 bytes to one kilobyte, four kilobytes. Um, the silly small size comes from my background in the demo scene. Um, if you don't know the demo scene, it's a group of people who, for about 32 years now, is trying to push the, the technical and artistic limits of any platform that they touch. I also do a lot of creative coding, and I really like that. Um, it's the practice of making art with code. And I love data visualization, which is all about communicating, communicating data in a visual way. Um, but ultimately, I just love to make art with JavaScript. Um, today, I would like to demystify this craft and to see you bring your ideas to life with code. So we will try to do that today. Um, I would like to highlight a project from 2013, 2014. Um, that's the French, sticking out. Uh, it, this project is called Phantom Terrence. It was made by Frank Swain and Daniel Jones, and using phone and uh, hearing aids, uh, which are these small devices that help people who cannot hear well. Um, what they did is essentially a Geiger counter for Wi-Fi networks. And that way you walk around anywhere, and the phone picks up the uh, Wi-Fi networks, and they emit a click sound in the, the hearing aid. And that way you can actually, let me, let me go to the next slide. So what you, s yeah. so here you can hear the clickety sound of all the Wi-Fi networks um, along the walk they did in London. Um, and the colors represent where they walked, the intensity of the network, the encryption level, and all these things. Um, this project is really beautiful because it shows a hidden, hidden side of the data that is all around us and we will not think about or not even perceive. Uh, but we can do similar things, similar pieces of art with JavaScript. And we can exploit data in new ways, data and code in new ways. Um, to do that, I think the key is to have a creative mindset. It's all about knowing the standards and abusing them and as other speakers have said today, things don't have to be perfect. They just have to, to be good and better than they were yesterday. So you, you just need to get a visual understanding of mathematics. Don't get scared about big formulas. All you really need to do is to understand what they mean. Um, so here's a small project. It's about 56 bytes, something like that. Uh, what you can see at the top is something that looks like a maze in diagonal. And that's the whole code base that you see here. Um, the, so on mouse move, um, I append a random character, almost random character, to the HTML. And this randomness comes from the event page X module 3, which picks basically a random character, one of three random characters in the string that you see here. But you only see two characters. Uh, it's because there is a zero width white space, which you don't see because it's zero width. And this zero width white space allows the, the stream of diagonals to actually have some space so that the lines break and you don't get just one straight line. So it's all about abusing standards and like thinking in slightly different ways. Um, when I do these projects, um, since I come from a demo scene and because I do them also in my spare time, I, I like to set myself free. I do that in straight away. Um, I use zero frameworks and libraries. I just want to focus on the problems I have at hand and just do that. Um, and as much as possible, I try to use a single primitive and one formula to drive the visuals and the sound. Uh, what you see in the background, visually, it's only triangles with shadow blur, nothing more. Even the long straight line is just very, very flat triangle. And the sound and the explosions is all driven by the same formula, again trying to, to reuse things. Um, to do this kind of projects, you would play a bit with trigonometry. 
which is a big word to talk about things moving in circles and following smooth curves. Um, and things don't have to be perfect, even there. It, if you want to make something very small, you can use these approximations. Um, you probably all heard at school, in uh, elementary school, that uh, 7 pi is almost equal to 22, and you can see that here. Um, 1 is almost pi over 3, and so on and so on. Uh, the, the errors in these approximations are very small, actually, and you can use them without, without noticing over a short animation. Um, and in the same idea, um, numbers in JavaScript and many other languages are based on the IEEE 754 specification, uh, which specify how numbers are expressed in binary, like in zero and ones in computers, as a combination of powers of twos and fractions of power of twos. That's fine. <laughs> so you may, you may have heard that when in, in JavaScript and many other languages, it's not exclusive to JavaScript. When you add 0 0.2 and uh, 0.1, you don't get 0.3, you get 0.30004, which is a so-called fronting point error. It's normal, it's just because 0 0.3 cannot be expressed exactly as a composition of powers of twos and fractions of power twos. It's unexpected, but it's, it makes total sense. So if you do a loop from 0 to 10 with an increment of 0.1, the numbers, because 0.1 cannot be fully expressed as a power of two, or fraction of power of two, the numbers on this loop cannot be all expressed exactly, and at the end, i is not equal to 10, it's equal to 10.099999. But if we use an increment that is a fraction of power two, all the numbers along that loop can be expressed exactly, and that gives us some nice properties. So, abusing standards and specifications, we can see here, um, I just have some empty text, an increment of that is a fractional power two, and when there is a fractional part, on the, on the counter of a loop, I just add a number, uh, the, the integer part of it. So you see the zero, one, two, three, because it's 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And when there's no fractional part, which means when the um, i has reached an integer value, which we will do every eight iteration of a loop, I add a backslash n, and so I go to a new line. And that way I just combine two loops in one by just using an increment that is a specific value. So y you can use or abuse the standard like that. Um, for your animations, you probably want to play with colors. And it's very tempting to use the HSL color space. Um, in HSL, basically, you specify the color by pointing on the color wheel, uh, which shows the colors of the rainbows. It's super nice because it's, it's really easy to get nice colors that change over time. But the problem is that it's a bit difficult for uh, browsers to parse. And if you have a thousand items or thousand elements that need a color per frame, on a powerful computer you can easily count 10 milliseconds just to do that. And you don't have 10 milliseconds to spare. So instead you can think of what is going on there. W what is happening on this color wheel? We, we can actually decompose it. So when we were spinning along a color wheel, it's actually a composition of three wheels of the RGB components, just shifted by one third of the circle. And that's exactly what is happening here in code. I just said the RGB components shifted by one third of a circle for each component. And it's an order of magnitude faster. So just some things to try to measure. And it's, it's a little bit bigger, but it doesn't matter because it's so much faster. It's, uh, <coughs> It's about understanding what is going on and trying to replicate it when it needs to be. Uh, for animation, it always looks rather nice to add a bit of motion blur. And it can be really complicated or it can be really simple. And I like simple things. The easiest way is instead of drawing a full black rectangle on top of your animation before you draw the next frame, just draw a black rectangle at 10%. And that way you just have some leftover from a previous frame and from a previous frame and from a previous frame. And that's why you have this nice trail that leaves the motion blur. Super simple, super cheap. It just works. Um, to do shiny things, um, in CSS you can use box shadows. Um, that works perfectly fine, no problem. Um, in Canvas you can use shadow blur. Shadow blur is, um, it's named shadow, but it's not about shadow. It's about drawing the same shape, but blurry. And you can use that to make shadows, but also to make things glow. Um, I always like to make music in my projects. 
And on the web, there are two ways to do music. Uh, there's the audio element, which is very simple, uh, which basically can only load a sound and play it and pause and so on. Uh, there's the web audio API, which is more complex. It allows you to build a whole audiograph of oscillators, filters, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can load the sound on MP3 or, or Vorbis, that's totally fine. But I like to generate sound procedurally. Um, and to do that in uh, using the audio element, what you need to do is to basically create a WAV file and load it as a data URL. Um, the code is, yeah, it's a bit long, that's okay. Uh, but what is import important, somewhat important, is the first two lines just create the header of the file, the two lines in the middle create all the samples inside that WAV file, and the last two lines just create an audio element, load the sound as by 64 and play it. It's about 180 to 100 bytes. And using the audio um, context, we can create a script processor, uh, which um, which you connect to the destination of the audio context and then gets an audio process event whenever the audio context needs new, a new chunk of sound to, to be processed to play. Um, and that way, whenever the audio context needs some sound, we, we have this event that says, give me a new sound buffer and we can generate it. And it's about also 180 bytes. And that way we can also create sound on the fly. It's really nice. Um, to make music that way, um, you have to code it. Um, so just some very, very quick basics of sound. It's to make a sound, you basically need an oscillator or several oscillators, an envelope to shape these oscillators, and then the volume, and you that just generate your sample. Um, so to make a hi-hat, uh, which sounds like you just need the noise oscillator, then um, an envelope, which is an exponential decay. So from the position inside the note, you start at one, and then you have uh, this powerful decay that goes down, and very, well, full volume. That's how you get a hi-hat, and building small elements like this, you build some music. Uh, you need also a render loop to render every frame of your animation, and the way to go is obviously a request animation frame, which will wait for the next um, frame of your device to actually call your function and render the next thing. Uh, that's the right thing to do. But if, if you are a bit naughty and you already use the audio, um, audio context, you can abuse the audio process event to actually hit two birds with one stone. Uh, you can render the sound, but you can also render the visuals in the audio process event, and it's fine. So, you see, it's all about getting creative mindset, like abusing the standards, having visual of understanding of the math behind things, and, and just having fun. Um, so, that's how I go about making art. Uh, with just it, and now I think it's time to to live code. Um, so today I would like to do something um, inspired by the Conway Game of Life, which is some kind of um, a simulation of life of like cells in the, inside a petri dish. Uh, if there's more cells, if there's more bacteria uh, in one spot. They just die out of overpopulation. If there's not enough, they die out of underpopulation. And if it's just the right amount, they just multiply. And just build up on that and have some sound. So let's lower this slide. Right. Okay. So on one side, I have this uh, live file with a dev tool open. <laughs> and I have this uh, text editor. When I do live coding, I usually go for 2D canvas and just a text editor, just a web browser open like the most simple setup you can imagine. So that, yeah, there's no, there's no extra magic, it's just coding. And you see that it is possible. So um, I start with a blank document, uh, full size body and, and HTML uh, with Flexbox to center a canvas, which you see here. And at the bottom I have a couple of uh, notes uh, that I will need for the music and a couple of helper functions for transform notes into frequencies and so on. Um, but we'll get to that later. So first, um, usually I, I like to, to do everything procedurally, uh, but I don't have so much time now. So I will load an image. Um, so. And yeah, please don't hesitate to shout out if I make any typo.
and yeah, pe people will get mad at me. Uh, I put everything in one file, and <laughs> I <laughs> I don't put var const or let or anything. So yeah, normally I don't do that. I don't do that at work. Uh, but anyways, uh, so um, so when the image loads, I like to set uh, to store the width, set the width of the canvas, which comes from the width of the image. Uh, same for the height. Da -da -da. Image height. Um, it's been nice to get the area so that we get the area of the Petri dish where we will have our game of life going on. And uh, the context of our canvas. Get context. Um, and we can do. Yay, we have an image. Amazing. So um, so now that we have an image, it would be nice to get some kind of our render loop to get started. So we need a time. Um, I will use the audio context uh, way. That way I can generate sound all the time continuously. Uh, and, it's, and it's also easier to be in sync with, um, with the visuals. Uh, so I have an audio context, now I, I need to create a script processor. Uh, about um, 20, 2048 is the number of samples that will need be generated in this audio process event. It's just a small buffer sound. Zero is the in input channels. There's no input channel. Mm -hmm. And one is the output. So I will output in, uh, in mono. That's, that should be fine. Uh, I need to connect this script uh, processor to the destination. Destination. And on audio process. So does anything happen? Okay. Nothing. And that's totally normal because I did nothing special. I just did the loop. Uh, but now I would like to say get a hold of the audio data. So that's from the, uh, I grab the event handler or the argument of the event. I get the output buffer and the channel data of the first output channel. So that's where I will populate the sound data for this chunk of sound that we need to generate. And the time, uh, the time increment for this process event will be basically the size of this buffer divided by the sample rate of our audio context. Um, you need to do that because it's not actually standard. Um, WebKit and uh, Safari, oh sorry, Chrome and Safari uh, output sound at 48 kilohertz, and Firefox tends to go for 44 kilohertz. So you need to, to double check that. Um, and just to be sure that our time is updated correctly, uh, we will output it. So we fill text, time, at some position. Oh, we forgot to actually clear the image at each frame. Um, because I will display the, the dish uh, with all the bacteria living in, I would like to use the image data um, so that I can modify the alpha channel of the, to represent every cell. So I need to get the image data. So that will be, after drawing the image, get image data, the whole thing, so with height. And I like to get hold of the RGB values directly. So that's the data of the uh, image data. And uh, before I draw my thing, I would like to say, uh, just make sure I reset the width, so it resets every property. And I will put the image data back in place before drawing the time. Uh, yeah, put image data. OK. So we have time. Um, this color doesn't look super great. So I would just set some new, some shiny colors. So I will set the fill style and also the shadow color while we are at it to be some, some kind of orange-ish. Um, and I also like to make things glow, uh, as you probably noticed before. Uh, global composite <coughs> operation. 
uh, which basically sets how the pixels are rendered on top of the canvas, uh, which operations we use a bit like um, the mode in the layers in Photoshop and similar graphic packages. Um, trying to keep on track. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, better. So it looks a little bit nicer. Um, so, yeah. Now we need to do our game of life. Uh, so for that, uh, we need a dish, uh, like I seen a, like the petri dish where people were growing bacteria. Uh, it's just an array, update dish. Uh, so I will loop for every y coordinate. I will loop on yeah, X and Y for the whole dish. Um, and da -da -da, I need, of course, an index inside the dish. And I would like to say, OK, the, the cell uh, now. For we will start with something, something very basic. Uh, just round value for random number. Uh, we will set that into the dish, the correct index. Now, and uh, the RGBA values of our image, we will set them to, if the cell is on, we say half the opacity. Uh, it's between 0 and 255. Um, and I want to actually set the alpha channel. So that will be the index times 4, because we are RGBA. And A is the last one, so plus 3. Plus 3. So now. What is going on? Uh, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, yes, I don't increment the index. Yeah. So now we have noise, which looks nothing like a game of life. What? <laughs> I'm really bad. Um, so the game of life, as I said, is basically like each generation looks at the previous generation and what was the population around it. So if there's yeah, enough, peop enough bacteria around, the cell comes to life or survives. If there's too many or too little, it dies. So what we need to do is get a snapshot of a dish before. So we'll do dish before. We call a slice of our dish from the beginning, which makes a copy. Uh, we need to check, was the cell alive before? And we need to count the number of neighbors. And since you're, we are in the UK, neighbors with you. <laughs> uh, so we need to check uh, around the end index i. Uh, so we need to check minus y, uh, well, in all directions. So one a negative uh, to go to the left, one positive to the right, uh, and minus width, plus width, and t -t 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 yeah. the, the eight neighbors. So plus one. Well, that's the part that is the most boring <laughs> to type. Uh, so. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, so I have here the plus, I need the minus, and now I can copy these guys here. And replace. Duck, duck. Yes. So that should be the count of the eight neighbors around it. And the cell now should be uh, basically uh, how was the cell before combined with the number of neighbors. And I if it's a goal, if it's about three, we'll say come to life. If it's, uh, if it's not three, don't come to life. And we get nothing. What is wrong? <laughs> what is wrong is that our dish was empty. There was nothing to come to life. So we need to actually add, bring some life to this dish. Uh, so I will, I will count uh, for the cells. Uh, just uh, if cell so now. I'll say. Increment the sum. Uh, so I, I will basically count how many cells were alive in one frame and 
Add. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yeah, uh, then I, I get the count of uh, cells, and I will need to bring some life uh, to the dish. And so what we can do is that we can start from the number of cells that were before to some maximum amount of life we want to add to this, this prime. Uh, so we will, we will flip the cell at a random position in our dish. So to get a random position in our dish, it's random value times the area, pipe zero. Pipe zero is basically a shortcut for math.floor to get an integral value. And uh, this basically flips a bit, like it just toggles between zero and one, if it's. And the max, let's say 10% of the area. 78. Yes. Yeah. There we go. <coughs> yeah. But you see, the life comes to life like bam, right away. Um, it would be nice to actually for it to come progressively. Uh, so we can check the time and have have some kind of like like a master volume, like when you are mixing uh, some music, you just start low and then you just shh, go gradually. So we can do that just by checking our time. And let's say we, we take the minimum of one so that we will stop at one and the time divided by 10, let's say. So at, at, uh, at the very beginning, it will be zero. At five seconds, it will be 0 0.5 and so on. Uh, and then we can inject that into this calculation when we bring some life uh, times the master. So you see now it starts slowly. Um, and since I like to make shiny things, um, I would like to have some, some beam of colors, um, some vertical beams of color where things are more populated. Uh, so for that, I need a list of beams. Um, and I don't know, for some reason, I like to have 12 here. So here's 12. Um, it's, it will be useful to get their width because I want these beams to be spread out evenly on the, on the area of, the, of our animation. So that will be the width of our animation divided by the number of beams. And also, uh, it will be useful to get the area of each beam. So that will be the beam width times the height of the whole animation, because I will draw them just to beam width, full height. And we also need then, um, like we do to count how many cells there are in the, whole, um, in the whole animation, we need to do that for each beam. Uh, so do this. And that will be x divided by sorry, beam's width, and this pipe 0, which is math of floor. Um, so now we get. Let's see if we broke anything. Mm. Still works. It's beautiful. So um, let's do some neon beams. Um, so I like them. I would like them to glow, um, and so I will use shadow co uh, shadow blur on the same width of the beams, so that they really bleed out. Um, so let's draw these beams. So that would be just a, a rectangle uh, at x times the width of a beam from the top. That would be beam width wide and full height. And the alpha um, to make this the intensity of the beam uh, depend on the population in this column. Uh, will depend. Oh, so the alpha will depend on the population in this column. So uh, we then we set the global alpha to be the sum of cells alive in this particular column beam uh, divided by the area of the beam, because there can be only as much as beams area cells alive in this beam, uh, but then the number will be really small, so we can multiply them by, let's say, 
8. So we should start to see yeah, some beams of light shining through. Uh, it's, it's neat, but it's a little bit chaotic. Um, so one way to actually to tame the chaos is to actually use power, <laughs> literally. So you can actually uh, apply a math power with a high value, and what you will do is we'll uh, get any value into an exponential. So when we have this uh, this value here, beam i times, oh, and so on, uh, by adding this power eight, we basically push down the low values closer to zero so that they don't shine through. They, they only shine when they're really high. So let's try again. We, it should be less noisy. Yeah, a bit less. Uh, so that's nice. Now, let's try to make some music. Um, OK, so we will loop through. Uh, all our audio data. And ta -ta 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 -ta. Um, so for that, I like, yeah, we need to actually get the time for every, every sample, every tiny sample that we will generate for this piece of sound. So that's one divided by the sample rate. But we are already modifying the time above at the beginning of our loop. So we need to stop doing it and only do it when we generate the sound. And music goes by beats and bars and patterns like sheets of music. So I like to get the beat uh, to be 120 BPM because time is in seconds. So that's the 60 seconds in one minute. Times two, that's 120. That's our beat per minute, 120. Uh, one bar is. Uh, four bits and one pattern, uh, like one sheet of music. You can think of it as one sheet of music. Uh, would be, let's say, uh, four bits. Um, so, and we need, sorry, we need like a small sample. Uh, what is the, the s smallest sample of sound that we are generating at this very moment? So we start at zero, and we just output the sound. Uh, so we need to do apply our master volume to it. Uh, and we say sample. So there should be nothing special now because we have not created sounds. So let's make a simple flute, or something like flute. I'm a terrible musician, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, so let's start with a rather low volume. Uh, I would like to get the note. And for that, you saw at the beginning that I have a two small arrays of notes, uh, just so that I don't have to fiddle with, yeah, to experimental music. Uh, so I, I just get the note, and from that um, MIDI note, I, will, I get the frequency. Um, yeah. And then I need the envelope to shape this note, uh, to shape the you note. Know, and that would be each um, note of this flute would be for one bar. And I will use uh, a a pure tone, uh, which is basically a sinus sound. So it will go like It's just one tone. Uh, I have this helper functions. Uh, da -da. So hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So now that we have sound and we have visuals, maybe we should display the sound. Um, so we can do that. So we need to know where we are, or basically map the, the length of our sound to the width of our screen, uh, and to know at which part of the sound we need to draw which pixel on screen. Uh, so when the index, uh, that's some kind of a spectrum analyzer. Uh, um, so if the index is greater than the next position we will want to draw, uh, we can do a field right at x, which we increment, and the height times, we start at the middle, plus the sample say, divided by 8. And we'll do one pixel wide. And just to be nice, we will set the height of this pixel to be the height of the master. So it, it will start 
at zero, and then we just grow and become visible. Uh, and we need to increment the next index where we'll need to do that. Uh, that would be the length of our data, of our audio data, divided by width. Yeah, you see this line coming to life. So now let's let's ha add some, yeah, a bit of rhythm. Uh, let's add a bit of hi-hat. Um, it's always a nice way to do that, to give the pace of your music, like to do that. Um, so we'll start with a, um, with an envelope uh, that is like the exponential decay that I showed in the slides before, and I will put it on the beat. And eight of exponential decay uh, is more than enough. Uh, the volume should be uh, actually for volume. Let's be a bit crazy and let's make like a small pattern. Uh, so let's say. Uh, First bit will be 0.2 in volume, second bit will be zero, and then uh, second and third will be 0.1, and so on and so on, to give like a bit of pattern. Um, and the sample will be uh, some noise, times the envelope, times the volume. Something I like to do is to go a bit, yeah, to make things crash a bit. So I, I like to add a, a crash symbol. Uh, a crash symbol is basically like it comes, like it, you, you can feel it coming, like, and then it just crashes massively. So we'll try to do that. Um, so the, so of course, well obviously it's a bit like a hi hat. That would be a noise. Um, so we need. Um, we need an envelope that will just grow small, uh, slowly, um, and that will be um, on the pattern, so that it will go slowly, um, times one, and we will do uh, the exponential increase. But the like the crescendo, we don't want it to go like full volume. We want it to like it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, and then psh, the crash to be really intense. So we just put this small volume, and we don't want it to crash right away. We want it to crash from the first pattern, from the second pattern. Uh, uh, that would be uh, why well, we have two cursors. Um, and we want it to crash hard, really hard, and to crash backwards. And you see, there's no times 0.2 or whatever, it's like full intensity. So we, we should hear something like growing. And, uh, Audio data, we can also use them to um, to shake the screen. Uh, so can, when we put, display the image, uh, we can set the y coordinate to be related to the, the audio data. Uh, we can multiply it by the height because audio data is between minus one and plus one. Uh, so times the height, but not going too crazy. Let's divide by four. Uh, why isn't the crash symbol coming? Yes. for a crash symbol to actually crash, which it doesn't seem to, ah, it's because I didn't set the volume there, sorry. 
Yeah. Let's try it again. I was using volume from the from the hi hats. Uh, so let's add some melody while it's coming. Uh, So uh, for the melody, I will grab the note. Uh, so that will be on the bar. But I will add some kind of arpeggio. Uh, an arpeggio is like when the note changes quickly. Uh, so the note, the bass note, will be on the bar, but the arpeggio will be on the beat. And, and uh, I would like to get the frequency. Since uh, the arpeggio is on the beat, uh, I need the envelope to be on the beat as well. And I will use a volume of 5.3, that should be about it. And I need to add all that. I will use a, a sawtooth oscillator. Sawtooth oscillator is basically from minus one goes to plus one and then start again. Uh, the nice thing about this kind of oscillator is that it it contains many frequencies, so it's a really rich sound. That's about it for today. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, then comes the big question: Why? <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually two why. There's like, why do I do this on stage, live coding? Um, I think it's. I think it just nails the part about creative coding and to show that just by doing small things, uh, you can actually build something really cool and and shiny in not too long, if you know a little bit of the concepts behind it, and you don't need to know so much. Uh, so I, I think this format allows to show that it is possible. And then there is the other why. Why do I do this at all? And uh, Martin Klepper put it this way. He said it's, it's damn fun. And creative coding is super rewarding. You just code and you have the instant feedback of what you're doing. And it feels good. You, you learn a lot by doing it. And working on these silly projects, you learn how to structure your code. Even if it doesn't look like it, when you, when you actually go down to like finish this thing, you, you have to structure the thing. And it also teaches you how to focus on solving the right <coughs> problem. So thank you so much, FFConf. It's been an amazing conf, really. And if you have any question, uh, find me on Twitter or in person. I'm P01. Uh, you should check out the Codember hashtag. Uh, this month there is like a creative coding month, and there is some really really cool stuff happening. So just have a look, and most of the things you can check with source code and everything. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>